Hello everyone, welcome to our mid-year market update and tax time webinar. My name is Sarah King, I'm Head of Client Care and Advice at Stockspot and I'll be taking you through our webinar session today. Thank you so much to all of you for tuning in over your lunchtime. It's certainly a wet rainy day here in Sydney so if you're tuning in it's a great opportunity. So it's great to see so many familiar faces and, and names on the, on the session today and for anyone new who's tuning in for a webinar for the first time Welcome. I mean, it feels like just a few months ago we were sitting here doing our end of year webinar. The year is certainly flying by. Okay, so moving on to today's agenda, we've got quite a bit to get through today. So initially I'll be covering a market update along with an investment update for each of the ETFs and assets in our model portfolios. I'll then take you through the performance for both the model and sustainable portfolios, particularly focusing on the last 12 months. And it is that time of year, so I'll be giving you lots of information in the lead up to tax time, when to expect your tax statements, as well as the upcoming formal annual review View process that we'll be holding from next Friday, the 7th of July. And of course, leaving plenty of time at the end for Q&A, because we want to make sure that we're addressing any of your questions um, that you might have throughout the session. So on that note, just a little bit of housekeeping. You might notice that we are using a different uh, webinar platform for those who have joined previously. This is StreamYard. Note that that little uh, poster comment box is where you should enter any of your questions, and we will get those to at, go get to those at the end. Any that I can't manage to cover today, do not worry because either Hannah or myself will follow up with you after the session. And that little duck, it is not our new stock spot mascot. That is part of the StreamYard platform. There's also a little black cog there that I've put there. Any of you who may be having uh, streaming quality issues, please click on that on that clog. I think it's in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and you can click it over to 180 um, and it should improve your streaming quality. So just to note, this session will be recorded. So if you do need to drop off, don't worry, we'll email, we'll email you a copy. Uh, and finally, importantly, uh, anything covered today uh, should be considered general in nature only because we're not taking into account any of your personal or financial circumstances. Alrighty, so let's kick off with the first session, um, which is our market update and investment update. So I, I think any of you who tuned into our um, webinar last year, there were certain some themes that I mentioned that we were likely to see coming into 2023. And a lot of those have continued to, to persist throughout the, the start of the year. I mean, the top five that I've listed here are really around high and persistent inflation, rising interest rates, you know, continued talks of a potential recession, property property market and mortgage stress, along with geopolitical risks. Now, kicking off with inflation, certainly inflation is remaining high, well be above the, the RBA's target band of 2 to 3%. It's about 7% here in Australia, in the US hovering around 5 in the UK back around 7 so much, much higher than global central banks want to see. Um, and what this is doing is creating a lot of costing li cost of living pressures for us all. I think we're all really starting to feel it, whether it's through our rents, our mortgage repairs, payments, our utility bills, uh, it goes on and on. Um, and what we have actually seen in a bid to get this level of inflation down is continued uh, hikes in interest rates from some of the big global central banks. We're now sitting at a 4.1% cash rate here in Australia. That's the 12th rate hike that we've seen. Over in the US, it's at 5.25%. And in the UK, they did just raise rates again to 5%. Now, an important thing, given all of this is high inflation and rising rate environment, there are some assets that tend to do well in periods of high inflation. And they're things like shares, and that's because companies can actually pass on those higher costs to their customers. Whereas things like rental property may suffer that bit more, obviously because rental yields are reduced and you're facing higher borrowing costs. Now, there is talk of continued rate hikes to get inflation back to uh, that target band of 2 to 3%, and that is still sparking talks of a potential recession playing out here in Australia, in the US. There is a lot of fear around that. But if we look back to 12 months ago, there was also a lot of talk about an impending recession here in Australia. So when and if it may occur remains to be seen. Uh, but it is something to keep abreast of. Um, but yeah, as and when it will happen, we'll, we'll, we'll soon find out. Um, we're definitely see, seeing continued property market and mortgage stress. I think in some areas we're seeing rising property rates, but a lot of that is driven 
driven by tighter supply. People aren't moving around as much as they were because the cost of mortgages have gone up so significantly. There's also these big upfront costs like stamp duty. But we're also seeing a lot of limited new dwellings coming to market. A lot of property developers are delaying construction because it's so costly to, to build properties now. Um, and yes, yeah, so that is limiting that supply. Many are even actually on selling land and not going ahead with property developments at all. But most importantly, I think many Australians are now facing significant mortgage stress. Uh, those who borrowed at ultra low rates are now rolling off those fixed rate mortgages and, and feeling, feeling the pinch with much, much higher um, mortgage repayments each month. So that's so, it's certainly something we'll continue to see in the foreseeable months. And last but not least is geopolitical risk. I think this is now cited as one of the top concerns for investors. Uh, there is continued conflict between Russia and Ukraine. We're seeing a lot more coverage on this at the moment. Uh, it's been going on for well over a year now, as well as continued tensions between, you know, China and the US and in terms of trade. So lots of things going on, um, even though some of these things may be impacting you personally. Uh, when it comes to your investment portfolio, we really don't want you to be focusing on these two much because we have built a portfolio for, the, for you that is designed to weather all types of market environments, particularly these high inflation and high interest rate environments. And I think this is a really good segue into the next slide because given all of that doom and gloom, and sorry to start on a bit more of a negative pitch there, um, but it's interesting to see that all of the investments in the stock spot model and sustainable portfolios have risen in the past financial year. You wouldn't think so given what's going on, but we can really see the benefit of investing in other assets uh, like global shares. We can see here leading the charge at 19.6%, Australian shares at 12% over the last 12 months and gold up 9.8%. This really shows that assets um, in high inflationary environments can generate better returns over and above inflation, um, which is what you want. And that is why you're investing for the long term so that your money can grow ahead of inflation. If we then look at Australian bonds, Bonds. Great to see that they're up this year as well, 3.9% to close the financial year, and then emerging market shares up 3.4%. Now, if we do look at these assets, even though they're positive, if you adjust that for, for real returns, so that's when we adjust um, for inflation, which is about 7% here, they are a little bit backwards in real terms. And that's also similar um, with cash. I get a lot of questions from clients at the moment about Sarah, you know, you know, the cash rate's so good, I'm getting such a good rate on my savings account, should I still be investing? And the answer is yes. I mean, money kept in cash for the long term is going backwards and, and doesn't grow ahead of inflation. And so that's the benefit of investing. But remember, investing is for, for the long term. So great to see a very different picture to where we were this time last year, where a lot of assets had fallen, but really also shows the benefit of sitting tight through those choppy market times when your portfolio dips, because you know negative periods are usually followed by periods of positive performance, as we can see here. Um, and so what I'll be doing now is going through each of the asset classes or investments that make up the stock swap portfolios in a bit more detail. So kicking off with Australian shares, finish the year up 12%. This has been, you know, driven by um, strong returns in resources stocks, banking shares, um, and yes, also a weaker Australian dollar. A lot of you would also know that we do have that higher allocation to Australian shares in our portfolios, and that's because they are that bit less, less risky than global shares, but also they have been a really solid, consistent source of returns for Australian uh, for Australian investors over the last century, uh, returning around 10 to 11% per annum. You also get the benefit of franking credits and income uh, paid through, you know, VAS if if you're holding our model portfolio, um, and that comes in each quarter. And that income return is a really important part of your overall total return. So again, looking at, you know, last year, shares were down, they've now recovered um, quite significantly. So really, again, shows the benefit of sitting tight when share markets fall and staying invested and knowing that you've got a sensible investment plan. Now, moving on to global shares. Wow, there's been a strong recovery here. Uh, they finished the financial year up 19.6%. Uh, you know, FY22, they were slightly positive, if not sort of flat. Uh, but a lot of the growth has been driven by those big uh, technology stocks that we hear about over in the US. So Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, NVIDIA. And a lot of that is linked to this boom that we're seeing in artificial intelligence. I think all of us have heard about ChatGPT in the last few months, and it is driving a 
a lot of the returns in, in, in the global share space. But again, it really points to even within an asset class like global shares, why you want to have exposure to different sectors. So not just technology, but also um, different countries as well. So not just the US. A lot of these tech companies are over in the US. So you want to make sure that you're accessing different countries, regions and sectors through your global share allocation so that you can reduce risk. Because if we do see this AI sort of boom, uh, I guess, subdue or, you know, cool off a bit or, you know, it is a potential bubble that's going to burst, you want to make sure that you're well diversified. And that's exactly what the IOO ETF provides is that that really broad diversification. And another benefit, of course, to talk about is the fact that it's unhedged. So last year, even when we saw the NASDAQ fall by about 32%, you can see that our IOO ETF was slightly positive. And that was the benefit of, you know, a weakening Australian dollar, um, which tends to cushion global shares um, when markets are also falling. So that unhedged um, nature also applies to our emerging markets uh, ETF, which is also another benefit. So moving on to emerging markets, they did suffer quite sizable falls last year um, and have rebounded to, to finish the year at 3.4%. Um, a lot of the falls last, last year were, of course, you know, the aftermath of COVID, China going into a second lockdown, a lot of those geopolitical tensions that were playing out. Um, but we have seen some recovery here. We know that China have, you know, their economy has recovered. Um, they've also softened, softened a lot of the regulations that were in place for some of the big companies over there. Um, but we've also seen a lot of those um, supply chain bottlenecks that were a big issue um, coming out of COVID subside to somewhat. So it is great to see that it's up 3.4% to end the year. And finally, moving on to our defensive assets, so Australian bonds. Uh, for many of our clients who were with us last year, uh, we all know that it was a year where both shares and bonds fell together. Typically, we don't see that with bonds. Uh, usually when shares fall, bonds do the opposite. And it was something we haven't seen in decades, but it's great to see that bonds are up, you know, 3.9% to end the year. And the reason that bonds fell so much last year is really linked to these raises, these rises in interest rates that we're seeing. When interest rates rates rise, bond prices fall, there's an inverse relationship. Um, but look, if we do end up going into a recessionary environment and see the RBA cutting rates, that will actually be really good news for bonds and we would see bond prices start to rise. What is important to point out with bonds as well is the amount of income that you're getting through the Australian bond ETF now. It has risen from about 3% last year to 4%. So I definitely recommend uh, logging into your dashboard view from time to time and going to the performance table to look at the income component of your return. It's really helpful to see that although sometimes there can be volatility and fluctuations in the capital return in the short term, you're still getting that steady source of income. And as we're seeing rates rise, you're, you're actually seeing the benefit of that as well. And again, bonds are a very important defensive asset in your portfolio. Uh, so definitely um, want to ensure that you've got a sufficient allocation to bonds as an asset class. And, um, you know, the benefit of IEF is that you're getting exposure to over 500 different high-grade government bonds. So that's, again, helping reduce risk within this asset class. And last but not least, our beloved precious metal, gold. I mean, gold has finished the year up 9.8%, slightly lower than last year. But the important thing here is that it's really provided that level of insulation for you uh, in your portfolio. You know, it helps to smooth out volatility and ensure your portfolio doesn't fall as much when share markets get bumpy. In it get bumpy. So it's really done its job over the past, you know, not just the past 12 months, but even through last year. Um, and yes, it's really there as an insurance policy uh, in your portfolio. So um, yeah, great to see it finishing up so strongly. And a very fun fact about gold, which even I didn't know until recently, is that the long term average return is actually 9% per annum for gold, which is really interesting. I think it's much higher than a lot of investors would actually imagine gold would be providing year on year. All right, so that sums up our investment update. And I think it really goes to show, although markets were bumpy last year, the benefit of staying invested, you've got such a broad mix of assets, growth and defensive to help cushion you in periods like we're in now of very high inflation and rising interest rates. 
All righty. So moving on to session number two, stock spot performance. So I'm just going to quickly take you through particularly the 12 month returns for our sustainable and model portfolios. I think uh, it's really pleasing to see that, you know, our, our model portfolios going from Amethyst, our most conservative, finished the year with positively up 6.3% to Topaz up to 10.5. So we didn't see this last year. It was actually our first year of negative returns. So a big change this year. Um, and that, that sort of variance between Amethyst, our most conservative, up to Topaz, is really driven by the share allocation in the portfolios. Obviously, the high growth portfolios have more exposure to Australian and global shares, and we can see that they have been the stronger performers over this, this past 12 months. Um, based on the slides I just took you through then, if we do look to the five-year average here, which is actually the best, uh, I guess, benchmark to be looking towards um, when you are looking at returns. What's the long term, you know, average I can expect year on year? These returns are still pretty good, looking at 4.2% down for, uh, for Amethyst, up to 6.9% in Topaz. Um, and these returns are actually, you know, over that five year period, if we look at how inflation has been for, for many of those years, it was hovering at around about that 2%. It's only the last 12 to 18 months that we've had high inflation. The portfolios have achieved returns over and above inflation, which is what you want and which is why you're investing in the first place. Now, another important thing I'll just point to here is a lot of your super funds, everyone's got money in super, will be publishing their performance soon. And these are actually really good returns for you to benchmark to. I mean, these are your broad index ETF portfolios. So you would expect that if your super fund has quite complex in investment approaches, that your, your super should be matching, if not be above these returns that we're publishing here. If they're not, um, you might want to speak to your fund and it's a good chance to reach out to them, ask them, you know, what fees are they charging you and how are they investing your money? So a really good benchmark um, for a broad index ETF portfolio here. Importantly, onto our sustainable clients. So the sustainable portfolios, as you can see, they have had a very strong recovery this year um, with returns for Amethyst uh, of 7.6% up to Topaz 12.7%. So very different to last year. I think last year it was the opposite. Our model portfolios were higher than sustainable. But this is really driven by the different underlying exposures between our model and our sustainable portfolios. The sustainable portfolios do have a much higher allocation to things like technology and healthcare, as well as exposure to parts of Northern Europe that have done quite well in the past 12 months. But look, um, you know, there will always be times where our model outperforms the, the sustainable and vice versa, like we're seeing now. And I always like to remind clients that if you are choosing to invest sustainably, it shouldn't be driven by returns. It should be a really strong values-based decision because you want to invest in companies that are supporting positive environmental, social governance factors. Now, a lot of you might say, Sarah, uh, my returns are look, looking nothing like these. Why is that? Uh, and it's really important to know that all of our clients' returns will always look very different to the published returns that we publish in our newsletter, on our website, that we go through in these webinars. Firstly, because they have different calculation methodologies. And these returns assume you started investing with Stockspot the very day that we opened and started tracking the portfolios close to 10 years ago. Whereas the reality for you, all of our clients, is that you've all started on a different day, a different month, different times in the market cycle. You're topping up differently. Some of you are taking money out along the way. And all of those things uh, really lead to, to differences into how you'll be seeing your returns in, in your dashboard. So if you've got any questions around that, please uh, reach out to me um, after the session. If you want to have a, a more detailed chat about your returns, more than happy to. Um, okay, so that's the performance. It's great to see that we've had a much more positive year. It was a very different picture last year. So, um, all righty, let's click on to our third session. Gosh, it's hard to believe that it's 30 June this Friday. Um, I think a lot of people are already, I've seen some emails today saying, when will my tax statements be ready? It is, you know, top of people's minds at this time of year, wanting to get your tax returns in. So I'll be giving you some uh, detailed info around when you're going to get those, as well as our upcoming annual review, which we're kicking off next Friday. Um, so let's start with tax time, first and foremost. 
So obviously investing in ETFs, you earn income, you have to pay tax on that the year in which it's earned. Um, so that will be um, something you'll need to pay tax on as long as any realised capital gains or losses that may have been incurred through some rebalancing that we've done for you or if you've withdrawn and we've had to sell down, that can lock in um, a capital gains tax liability. For those of you that we haven't potentially sold anything for, you might also see some small capital gains in your, in your tax documents. And this is from the ETF investments themselves. They often do some small amounts of rebalancing periodically throughout the year. Um, but what you'll notice is it's very, very small. And that's one of the benefits of ETFs. It's a very, very tax efficient investment compared to other investments like actively managed funds, where you'd probably, uh, or, or listed investment companies as well, where you might inherit much bigger tax liabilities. So that's why we're another reason why we're a big fan of ETFs. Um, so you will need to report on that uh, this year. Now, in terms of when your statements will be ready, it will be mid to late August. And I know a lot of you think, oh, gosh, I want to do my tax next week. Um, the reason is that ETFs are quite complex. Um, the ETF issuers have to put all of their tax information together first before they can even pass that on to us. So we don't get that from them until about until um, early August. And that's when we can start popping all of that information to generate your statements. And the important one, that because we want to make tax time as easy as possible for you, is your annual investor statement. So rather than you having to report on every single ETF individually, which can be very lengthy, time consuming, complex, we consolidate for you across all of the ETFs that you hold into a single statement. There's then corresponding reference numbers for you to pop that into the tax portal um, or you can shoot it across to your accountant. So saving you lots of time, um, making it very easy for you. There will also be other documents available that, uh, that you can reference realised capital gains reports, income and cash transaction statements, to name a few. So uh, the only uh, account type that won't be getting the annual investor statement, just to make that clear, is company account types, and that's because of their different tax treatment, but every other account type will get that annual investor statement. So please keep an eye out for that. There will also be a handy guide that I recommend you all read that gives you helpful information on completing your tax return. What you may also see as well from late July into August is some of the ETF issuers pre filling um, some of your ETF information into your tax portal. We really strongly recommend that you wait until we issue with your annual investor statement because not all of them pre-fill it in. So we want to make sure that you're giving really accurate info to the ATO and it's not causing any complexities or, um, you know, wasting your time more than you need to. So definitely keep an eye out. We're going to have some helpful timelines available on our website uh, this year so that you can keep up to date with where we are at with with your tax statements. There'll also be quite a few emails coming out as well. All righty. Um, the next important thing and your review. So as an advisor, we need to check in with you each year and make sure um, that the portfolio that you're in now, so your strategy, is still the best match for you. Um, we get it, things can change from year to year, your time frame might change, your risk profile might change, and we really need to know those things so that we can then let you know if we think a different portfolio is appropriate. So yeah, we want to capture any changes in your goals, your personal and financial circumstances, so that we can be 100% sure that you're still in the right portfolio strategy. Now, your investment profile is really focused on six key areas. A lot of you would know this from when you've signed up to get your initial portfolio recommendation or if you've done the annual review previously. You know, we want to know, you know, what's your goal? Uh, how comfortable are you with ups and downs? So that's your risk profile. You know, what's your time horizon? Is it three years? Is it five years? Is it 10? Um, what's your experience? Are you quite new or have you been investing for many years? Do you need to take out any income along the way? Um, and whether or not you have any high interest debt. If you do have high interest debt, of course, we, we really recommend that you focus on paying that down first ahead of investing because the rates you're paying on high interest debt are really, really significant and more than you can expect from investing in at least the first few years. Um, so... And your review process, it's going to kick off next Friday, the 7th of July. So we want as many of you to complete this as possible. Uh, it's really important that you do go in and let us know where you're at with your investment profile. So what you'll do, um, you'll log in uh, to the dashboard view. So that's via the website and go to the Your Profile section of the dashboard. You'll see here that there's a big blue button. That's that magnifying glass that says... Um, complete my annual review, you'll click on that and I'll show you on the next screen what we'll show for you this year. There's a little bit of, bit of a change there, but let's assume that your circumstances have changed. You're going to click on that option and then step through all of those uh, similar questions we asked you when you signed up. 
Now, the good thing is we're going to email you your results straight away. So let's say, for example, you know, you're in Topaz, but you've decided that, look, I might be buying a property, you know, in the next three years, so your time frames change. We're going to capture that through, um, through your responses to those questions. Then we might let you know that moving to, say, a more conservative strategy because your time frame has changed so much is appropriate for you. So that will be outlined in your results email. Please keep an eye out for that in your inbox. Um, we do not change anything for you. Please note that. We're not going to be changing your strategy. It's up to you. Um, but you've, you'll have you be given the options clearly outlined in that email. Um, and similarly, if, if your circumstances haven't changed and you select that option, you will also get an email confirmation to confirm that. Um, so just what I was talking about earlier, uh, we're conscious that for, for many of our clients, particularly those of you who have lots of kids accounts, or you know, your investment time frame is so long, a decade or more, not a lot changes year to year. So we wanted to save you a bit of time. And we've actually given you the option. So when you click on that button to complete your annual review, there will be a pop up and your actual investment profile will, will be shown. So read through it, make sure that all of it still applies. If it doesn't, uh, you would definitely be clicking on, I'd like to update my details. If you're not sure, please do it anyway. But for those of you where you know nothing's changed, you've got the option to say or click on, no, my circumstances have not changed. And that will complete your annual review um, for the financial year. So look, it's quick and easy. It will only take you a few minutes per account. And don't forget if you do have those multiple accounts, either under different email addresses or all linked under the same email, please switch to each dashboard and do the annual review for each of your accounts. So lots going on. We will be emailing you on Monday to let you know that the annual review process is kicking off uh, on Friday, the 7th of July. We will send you reminders along the way, but please try and do it. Um, once we send you that initial email next Friday, there'll be a, a button that you can click so you can easily launch into your dashboard and complete your annual review. All right, that's been a lot of information. So um, that pretty much sums up our um, the sessions I wanted to take through, take you all through. But now I'd like to open it up to you all and um, open it up to Q&A. So I see that we've got lots of questions and comments coming in, which is fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. All righty. So um, Gary, okay. So would you consider showing 10-year returns for each model portfolio? Great, Gary. Well, that would be great. When we do have 10-year returns, we will show those. I mean, our total returns are probably the best uh, indicator of, of that 10-year time frame. I think it's just shy of that. But once we have that 10-year return time frame, we would. At the moment, it's one, three, and five, but always look at that total return. That's a, That assumes that you started investing with us when we launched the portfolios, you know, um, you know, nine or so years ago. Question from Darren. Hi, Sarah. Do I have to declare the tax on my kid's account or is it my kid who pays the tax later on? Good question, Darren. And this is one we get often about kids' accounts. So with kids' accounts, minors can't own investments in their own name until they're 18 or older. So it's actually you, the adult, that has the account uh, in your name. So that means that you will pay tax on any income that's been received throughout the year, as well as on any potential capital gains that you might see. So that will be itemised in your annual investor statement. Um, so keep an eye out for it. But yes, until you either sell down in future years to gift your money, gift your children the cash or transfer it over to them, you will be paying tax each year for the kids' accounts. Great. Another question here. Do the returns include reinvested dividends on bond returns? Yes, they do. They do. Yes. So when we're reporting on those returns, so if you're talking to the actual 12 month return, I mean, that's looking at how much you've earned in terms of income and the capital growth component. But in your actual returns in your dashboard and the published returns does assume that we've reinvested distributions. That's a great question. Thank you. 
why okay slavica great why are there no ret no returns shown for five years for sustainable that's a good question i should have pointed that out because they haven't been around for five years we actually launched the sustainable portfolios back in july 2020 so they're just sitting on that three-year mark now so hence why we can only show the one and, and three-year returns along with those total returns for the sustainable but certainly once we've had another two years of the sustainable portfolios being around we would definitely be reporting on the five-year returns for those so yes just just a couple of years away um, but yeah we launched those soon after COVID we had such high demand for sustainable investing at the time um, yeah it's hard to believe it was three years ago um, so yes three years is all we have at this point in time thanks Slavika Michael do we send info to the ATO um, to, to populate the tax portal for your tax return? Another good question. So that's what I was mentioning um, in that tax update. We don't send info to the ATO. In fact, some of the ETF issuers do, but not all of them. So that's why we want you to wait until we issue you with your annual investor statement, because we'll be collating all of that information on your behalf from each of the ETF issuers, so you know, Vanguard, BlackRock, iShares, and pulling it all into your annual investor statement, which will be ready in mid to late August. So you will see some pre-fill information there. It's not from us, it's from the ETF issuers. But again, we urge you to, um, yeah, wait until you've got your annual investor statement for us so that, you know, you don't have to lodge an amendment or anything like that. I know that the ATO are clamping down on, you know, um, the taxation of ETFs and things like that. So it's just best to wait till you've got information for all of your ETFs from us. But yeah, really good question. Okay, another question from Darren. What if my time horizon changes before the annual review? Can I just change it in the platform or do I need to call? Yes, so you've actually got the option to update your investment profile anytime throughout the year outside of the formal annual review process. So if it does uh, change before next Friday, you can give us a call to chat through it if you'd like to. Otherwise, you can step through and review your investment profile in your dashboard. You go to the uh, your investment section, click on your portfolio and you'll see your profiles there to review and update. Um, but yes, you can do it. Ideally, it's great to do as part of the formal annual review, but you can do it any time throughout the year. But you, if you do do it outside of the formal annual review process, you may not get the clarity you need around which strategy is right for you. So we would recommend that you give us a call at that point in time to, to discuss that. All right, from Ash, we've got a question on have dividends increased over this financial year? Yes, we have seen a small increase in, in dividend yields. I mean, particularly through the bond ETF, as I mentioned. Um, so you get income from four of the ETFs if you've got a model portfolio through VAS, uh, through um, through bonds. And I think, you know, it's been great to see that level of income rising through bonds, but also, you know, the historical average for our stock spot clients for income is around two to 3% per annum, but certainly, um, particularly through that bond ETF, because we've seen the coupons that they're paying and the yields rise, you're getting more income. Definitely. Yes. So great question. Thanks, Ash. Okay, so Chatiana, uh, global shares were up 19%, which we notice in your slides. Would the investment strategy change for Emerald to invest in more global shares going forward? Yes, so as I mentioned in that global share update, our portfolios do have a bit of what we call a home country bias to, uh, to Australia. It's definitely a larger component of our overall share allocation. And the reasons I pointed to that is that, you know, global shares are slightly up the risk curve to Australian shares. Um, and, you know, you do get the benefit of, of income through Australian shares. So dividends that have franking credit entitlements attached. Uh, so at this stage, you know, your share allocation to Aussie shares in Emerald is around about 42%, you know, it, it, and to global shares, it's around about, you know, I, I think it's just shy of, you know, nine. Um, but at this stage, we wouldn't change it. And, and that's because, you know, at, at the moment, you know, we're seeing a lot of strong performance in the global developed market economies, particularly the US. And we expect that might cool off um, at some point in the future. And that's why you do have that decent allocation to emerging markets, because we think at some point there will come a time where the emerging market economies start to outperform those global developed market economies. But definitely um, a considered choice there through having that stronger allocation to Aussie shares, um, because they've provided, as I mentioned, a really strong uh, level of consistent returns 
you know, over the last century around 10 to 11 percent, and they're not quite as risky as the global shares that you invest in. Rob, good to see you on here, Rob. Um, maybe it's on the website, uh, but would appreciate having access to monthly statements, um, amongst other things that shows changes in capital and income. Great. Yes. Um, so, Rob, as you know, we issue with your financial statements um, at the end of the financial year, available in August. In case you haven't seen it, we do actually have uh, the ability to generate income and investment, oh, sorry, cash and investment transaction statements in your dashboard. Um, you can't filter by time frame. It will be since inception, but you can definitely do that, whether it's to a CSV or a PDF document. So that's available for you to generate in the um, transaction section of your dashboard. Um, and there's also what we did launch last year, which is great, is the uh, ability to run a, a portfolio summary report at, at, at any chosen date. And that will give you a full breakdown of your portfolio portfolio, um, the returns, income returns, etc., at a, a chosen date. So that's quite a new um, reporting feature that we did lodge. And look, we're always looking to improve our reporting suite. But yeah, it is great to know that those other reports are scattered throughout the dashboard for you to access when you need. Thanks, Rob. Felicity, uh, my portfolio is in joint names. Will the tax statement show separate totals for each owner or will I need to halve the figures when you do your tax? That's a really good question. I mean, I had a, a joint account with my husband um, last year and look, we give you just a single statement, but if you're doing your tax yourself, if you indicate that your portfolio is held with someone else when you're in the tax portal, it actually splits it automatically for you. So it does all of that hard work. Um, if you're if you're speaking to your accountant, of course, they'll know what to do. Um, but the, the ATO portal does make it very handy um, because they will ask you that question, is this account held with anyone else? You'll tick yes, and it will just split it straight down the middle. But yeah, our reports will just be the, the total amount for you both. Emiliano. So when will the annual review option become available in the dashboard? It's not enabled yet. So good question. So it will be next Friday, the 7th of July. So keep an eye out. We'll email you next Friday to let you know that the annual review uh, process has gone live. You'll then find that blue button that we showed in your, the, your profile section of your dashboard. You can click on it and then go through and complete your annual review. Um, if you don't get to it in the first couple of weeks, we'll send a reminder email a couple of weeks later. It does run for the whole month of July, but we just recommend that you get in and do it as soon as possible uh, so that it's done and we can close that off in your um, profile for the year. Okay, Anthony, with a change to Bank of Queensland, will we have direct access to the account as per we did with Macquarie Bank uh, or will deposits be visible in the Stockspot portal? Yeah, good question, Anthony. So um, for any of you who did um, formerly have cash accounts with Macquarie, pre us migrating you all to Bank, Bank of Queensland, one of the benefits with Macquarie was that they uh, set up online access for a lot of our clients, often without us knowing. Sometimes that led to you know, challenging things, people taking money out of their account without telling us and leading to failed settlements. Um, but um, no, you won't with Bank of Queensland, unfortunately. It's a different account structure. But the good thing is that all of your cash transactions update daily in your dashboard. So all you need to do is log into your dashboard, check the cash transaction section uh, whenever you need to. You can also download those reports I was just talking about, your cash transactions report. Um, but yeah, it, it's different to a, a normal retail savings account. So there isn't that login access, but, but don't worry, your, your dashboard has all of the up-to-date information. So thanks for that, Anthony. Okay, question from Ben. Uh, so dividends are currently reinvested automatically into my account. Is there an option to have these withdrawn to cash by default uh, if I want to use that as income in the future? And would it get transferred to a bank account automatically? Yeah, good question, Ben. So in case you haven't seen in your dashboard or for anyone, you actually have rebalancing settings. So there in the your investment section, um, in the Stockspot portfolio section. Um, so with Stockspot, the minimum withdrawal is 
$2,000. So depending on the size of your portfolio, often your distributions are a, a bit lower than that. Um, so, so we wouldn't really be paying those out to you unless you lodge a withdrawal via the normal process. But again, it depends on the size of your portfolio. Um, but look, for a lot of our retirees who do want to take their distributions out as income, we certainly help them with that because they need it to fund their cost of living. Um, but ideally, I mean, if you're investing and just starting out on your investing journey or a few years in, you ideally want to be reinvesting those distributions for as long as you can, because that is what really fuels the compound growth um, of the portfolio, as, as you may know. Um, but yes, there's certainly an option to do it. Um, give us a call, um, you know, or email me and we can have a, a good look at your portfolio and where you're at um, and, and what's going to be the best option for you just to ensure you're getting the most out of your portfolio. Um, but for those clients that we do pay them out to, we would pay them into their linked external bank account. But yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, okay, so another question about in the dashboard, there seems to be funds held in cash consistently. Just wondering if that's intended. Um, wondering if that's intended. Uh, or do you have to keep transferring? So yes, we will always maintain a small balance in cash for you. Um, the reason being, there's a few reasons. So um, if you're a fee-paying client, we want to make sure that you've got a little reserve there that we can debit fees from each month. We usually keep a small residual of about three months. That means that we don't have to bother you each month and say, hey, please, you know, top up your account because we want to debit your fees. But also sometimes when we're investing for you, there's a, a bit of a residual left over. I mean, some of the ETFs that we buy, the unit prices are are quite high. Um, so it can mean that there's $100 or so or a few hundred dollars left over and that will sit in your cash account. But as you continue to top up, if you're topping up, um, you know, and you get to the minimum, uh, you know, once your cash account gets to $500 for anyone with a portfolio under 50k, we'll go and invest that for you and buy as many ETFs as we can, leaving that small three month buffer. For portfolios over 50k, it's a little bit higher. It's when your cash balance gets to $2,000. So in between that, if you're topping up with smaller amounts, um, you know, it will just accrue in the cash account until that minimum trigger is reached. You can also look at the next investment tile in your dashboard. That will actually tell you if you keen to get money invested as soon as possible, it will tell you how much you need to add to trigger that next investment. So that's a really helpful tile to look at in the app and the dashboard. But yes, certainly what we want to make sure that there's a little cash buffer there for you at all times. Um, yeah, for those reasons I just mentioned. Okay, so by investing in a sustainable portfolio, does it automatically limit diversification? Would you please share your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I mean, the sustainable portfolios have been built the same way that we built our, our model portfolios. So looking at different asset classes, so having exposure to Australian shares, global shares, as well as bonds and gold. So you've still got that broad asset class diversification. But what we see, because the sustainable portfolios, they're screening out, you know, companies involved in gambling, tobacco, mining, resources, um, adult entertainment, a lot of things. It does mean that the underlying holdings are different. So it's not limiting your diversification. It's just that, we're, you know, through in wanting to screen out those types of companies, you we're screening those out or the ETF issuers are screening those types of companies out for you. So you've still got that broad asset class diversification. Um, you've still got exposure to hundreds of different companies through the sustainable portfolios, but it's those underlying holdings that are different. I mean, at the moment, there is a lot more, I guess, tilted to technology and healthcare, which have been benefactors in this current environment. Um, but that can change. But still really, really broad diversification for you there. Um, if you did want to have a chat about the underlying holdings, send me an email after this and I can give you some links on how to access those underlying holdings for you. Okay, wonderful. Good question. All right. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up most of the questions that we've been able to get through today. There was a lot. Thank you so much um, for posting your questions, for turning up today. I know it's your lunch hour. Um, look, and if we haven't managed to get to your question today, we will be in contact um, by the email address that you supplied when you signed up. So don't worry, we will get back to you um, within the next one to two days. So keep an eye out for that. If you want to have a chat sooner, just give us a call. We're on 02 
8091 8090 as many of you would know um, you can speak to Hannah and myself anytime just a reminder you know yeah please feel free to reach out to us at any stage if you have any questions we are always on hand to chat to you whether it's for advice needs general questions about your account anything at all um, we're really accessible and would love to chat with more on you so please get in touch and just a reminder, we do have our next webinar coming up in July. This will be with our CEO and founder, Chris Breike, who many of you know so well. And it will be a format that is an ask me anything uh, type of webinar. So you'll have the option to submit questions in advance or turn up on the day with all of your questions and Chris will be on hand to answer those. So have a think about that. It is being hosted on the 21st of July. So yeah, about a month or so from now, but there will be emails being sent out. So definitely recommend recommend you register for that one and um, have your opportunity to spend some time with Chris. All righty. So also a copy of this email will be a copy of this webinar will be emailed to you. So keep an eye out for that. You can watch it in your own time. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure to, uh, to connect with you all today and share our market update and tax time webinar info. Um, all right, well, I'll let you all head off and enjoy your lunch if you haven't had it already. And I'll hopefully speak to you all soon. Bye for now.